Hi everyone, welcome back to The Watch Insider. My name is Brian, this is Tim, and thank you guys for logging on. We've been on a two week hiatus, but we are now back with lots of great watches from the vault and different things to talk about. We've got an impressive slate tonight. I've got two watches I love that are my favorite color metal, basically silvery white. We have one grand complication from Audemars Piguet that is not a royal oak and an Oris that is near and dear to my heart, both because it's an Oris and because it's an Audi. We've also got some cool stuff from Brian. Yeah, so a lot of great stuff here. We're gonna get started with a what's on the wrist because Tim is wearing a knockout tonight. Uh, and as always, guys, please feel free. Any questions that you wanna ask, this is a great time. For, uh, for myself and Tim to answer any questions that you have about watches that are here on the table, watches that you're thinking of purchasing, or anything watch in general. All right, yes, that is a fact. I do have a rather explosive timepiece to share. Explosive and green. Swatch System 51 System Frog, you guys who are regular viewers all know it, 90 hour power reserve, automatic winding, 150 bucks, 42 millimeters in plastic, built by robots and held together by glue. This is about as low as low horology gets without a battery. It almost matches your glasses. It, it, we, it, need, we need to color coordinate next time. It exactly matches the glasses. The problem is the glasses are about a year older. Yeah, so you know we've got a little bit more uh, patina on the glasses than we do the watch. Okay. We need that Florida sun. I miss it. Okay. Uh, tonight I am wearing a Roger Dubuis Sympathy 37. I don't think that I've worn this watch on the show yet but uh, it's a watch that I picked up recently that I had been lusting after for a long time. I finally found one that fit the wrist great. So this is an early Roger Dubuis. I've talked about how much I love them on the show. It's from the mid 90s. It's his perpetual retrograde, it's his perpetual calendar retrograde. So in the 37 millimeter sympathy case. And what I loved about the watch, A, just the shape is unique to the brand, B, once Tim shows you the front of the watch, you'll see that the crystals uh, are actually cut to be the shape of the case, which I just think is absolutely awesome. Uh, you know, the dials are all handmade. I mean, this is when Roger Bui was making some of his finest pieces. This is a gorgeous piece because it's both a French Besançon Observatory chronometer and Geneva Hallmark signed. And the boxed, the boxed set with these things is monstrous. Now, a couple things you'll note about the dial. It is a perpetual calendar with retrograding action Dubuis was a complication specialist at Patek Philippe prior to his work with the company under his own name. The movement by himself as well as Agenor's Jean-Marc Viderecht. And it's important to note that the base, which is a Longines L990, is a twin mainspring barrel ultra-thin auto. And that's not even the most impressive thing about the watch. This particular case shape, though originally claimed by Roger Dubuis co-founder Carlos Diaz was in fact conceived by a Valley de Joux watchmaker and the first series, as Brian mentioned, featured the shaped crystal that paralleled the shape of the bezel. Later on, they got sick of making these because sealing it was so labor intensive. These were objectively just a pain in the butt for them to make. So they went with a round crystal and a shaped case, but with a round bezel and a round crystal, those later watches much less desirable and honestly much less distinctive. Yeah, so I'm just a big fan of the overall look, and I think that, you know, early Roger Dubuis, uh, you know, is a way to get into high complicated watchmaking uh, for really cool watches at a reasonable price right now. That's a fact. They are gaining watches, particularly from that era when Dubuis was technically a company called Sogem from about 1995 to about 1999. Those are the ones you really want, and those are increasingly dear. The, the real bargains are almost gone there. So if you want to get on board, that train is leaving the station. Yeah, so the next one I'm looking for is actually a, an homage 37 chronograph, which I think are just, you know, very cool and you see them pop up from time to time. Yeah. The best, the best homage chronograph would be to get the homage 40 with the blue dial with the perpetual calendar retrograde and the Lemagna CH27 base. That would be the one to own. And if that pops up, I'll be buying it. But uh, so why don't we get started with what we have on the table tonight? We'll let you, uh, uh, we got, so I have to bring an alarm watch for Tim. But not the one you expect. Brian, tell us, what are we looking at here? 
So here we're looking at a Blancpain Revive GMT alarm watch. So, and what makes this watch so special is that you can actually wind the watch and the alarm itself at the exact same time, which is a rarity. You know, very often when you see alarm watches, you you wind them separately. You want, you know, the alarm has its own winding mechanism, and then the watch itself has its own. And this one has a, a number of impressive functions built in. First, it's a Revive GMT, and you have that. You have that on-off indicator. And is this watch overkill? Not only do you have the on-off, but the on-off indicator is loomed. So is the power reserve for the alarm. You see, when I activate the alarm, the power reserve discharges, and you can see that at night. I'm also a really big fan of the combination of titanium and rose. I think the two colors play off each other very nicely, and that the, you know, the, the rose gives it a little bit of a sense of pop and richness, but it still remains a sporty piece. And you also have, which is signature to Blancpain, the rubberized leather straps on the Le Mans pieces, which give this watch, you know, that sort of dress sport watch feel that, you know, makes you think that you could, you know, dress it up or dress it down. You can see the caliber 1241. This is shared by Blancpain and also by Breguet. This came out in 2003. This is one of the most fascinating automatic alarm calibers I've encountered first because the striker for the alarm is black polished like a minute repeater striker. And second, because as bright as a Brian alluded, it can wind both the time-telling functions and the alarm automatically. Precious few alarm watches can do that. And you've got the second time zone, you've got screw-down crowns and 100 meters water resistant. Pretty much the works. The finish I would compare favorably to the likes of Parmigiani and some of the better efforts from Giger Lecoult and Audemars Piguet that are not quite Geneva seal level, but represent some of the very best in Swiss horology. So you're getting a sports watch that can swim, and you're getting hand finish of not quite the highest order, but the next best thing, and genuinely impressive. Yeah, so, you know, these are some of my favorite watches. I know that I've, you know, brought quite a few of them on the show, and, you know, every time I bring one on, I'm, you know, I'm still very much impressed by... Uh, how underappreciated they are in the market. That said, among mechanical watches, I probably get more questions about how to work that one than anything other than the Ulysse Norden Sonata. So if you do buy this watch, I'm there for you. Yeah, we'll get it, you know, if you buy this watch, we'll get Tim to do a custom video for you. Hell, if you buy this watch, I'll call you. All right, what have we next? Many rose gold watches. Tonight. Yeah, so why don't we do another sport piece? This one's special and it just came in, so I felt like it, you know, needed to be brought into the show. So for those of you that are looking at this watch, no, it is not a 5711-1A. It's something a little bit more special. So this is a reference 5800. And for those that don't know, the 5800 came out in 2006 along with the 5711-1A to commemorate 30 years of the Nautilus. However, this particular watch wasn't officially started shipping until 2007, and then it only had a one to two year production run, which makes this one of the more rare Nautiluses that has ever been produced. It's also the last of the monoblock cases, which makes it most similar to the reference 3700. So, you know, what you're seeing here is a short production run, stainless steel Nautilus in a contemporary case that was only made for a few years, and it happens to fit beautifully. It's an absolute sensation. This particular watch, of course, part of that single year of production spread over two model years, 2007 to 2008, last cataloged at about 19,800. This watch is worth about twice that today. Extraordinarily, most Patek Fleet collectors would rather own this watch than a 5711 because there are fewer of these and because of the monoblock case construction, that is not a screwed in case back. That is a true monoblock assembly. It is much closer in construction method to the original Gerald Genta patent, which was actually filed in the name of the Stearns, but it's his patent, and this watch is much closer in engineering to that one. So in many respects, this is the last living ancestor of that original jumbo, and I'll mention, it's one of the last occurrences of a 335 caliber in a Patek Philippe Nautilus. Yeah, and I'm going to get it on the wrist so that you guys can take a look to see, because it definitely is smaller than your traditional 5711, and it's more of a mid-size piece, which is probably one of the reasons why it was discontinued after only a few years. You know, as far as production goes, they wanted the capacity, I'm sure, to produce more of the 5711. Yeah, the other thing is, you think of the times, 2007 to 2008, that was the heyday of the Hublot King Power and the 48 millimeter Royal Oak Offshore. That was when things went truly overboard, and 
I might even say that was the year 2008 when Rolex went 44 millimeters and 18 millimeters thick with the deep sea. So this watch was the right watch at the wrong time in many respects. I think maybe if I show it on my wrist, I've got a skinny baby wrist. But the other thing is I have a video of this watch that's already up over a thousand views, which is impressive for a mid-size anything. This watch resonated with folks when I posted the videos on Watchbox reviews. You can check that out. It's unmistakably a Nautilus, handsome, slim, about eight millimeters thick, beautifully executed. It has the spectacular blue gradient dial of the 5711. Again, it's just a little bit closer to the original design and engineering DNA. Yeah, so awesome watch, something that you don't get to see every day, uh, and you know, truly a special piece, and something that I think flies under the radar that most Patek Philippe collectors don't even know what. Uh, know about. Similar to the 3712 in that regard, another, you know, the predecessor to the 5712 that was only made for, again, about one or two years. And it's important to remember that the midsize that was built before that one was built for all of 15 years. That one didn't even make it to 15 months. So once again, if you want that one, call us. Okay. Yeah. And guys, please don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat. You know, we're here. Uh, you know, to answer all of your questions and, uh, you know, just fire them off and, you know, as we see them, we'll, uh, you know, we'll answer. I can see Edward Ledden saying the only Nautilus for him is the 5712 in steel, which he will own someday. Two questions. First, do you really prefer the 5712 or is the 3712 the one you want? And let me know, do you prefer your 5712 in 1A or A? So that is with bracelet or without? Because they, I see them both ways. I see arguably as many 5712s on a strap as on a bracelet. So Edward, you're out in Sweden, you stayed up late to watch us. Let us know, what is your ideal moon phase power reserve small second Nautilus? Uh, Avi B, while we were talking about Nautilus, thoughts on 5990 versus 5980. You know, overall, I, I would say that these are the two watches that get the most comparison. And you know, to me that they're, they're you know, very different functionally and very different aesthetically. Um, you know, overall, I prefer the look of the 5980. I think it's, you know, more the, sim the overall simplicity of the watch as well as the size. It actually fits quite a bit smaller than the 5990, uh, you know, because of the, you know, the extending uh, pushers for the GMT function on the 5990. I'll also say you're kind of covered because you own a 5980 and a 5164. So you've got the Travel Time Aquanaut and you've got the Nautilus Chrono. So you're kind of you're kind of a purist. You have the two complications in isolation, but not in the same watch. Correct. And you know, while I do love the 5990, you know, I don't. I don't fully know how necessary it is to have a chronograph with a Travel Time. Uh, you know, even though. Uh, you know, Paddock made a remarkably simple one to use, which I think is one of the best parts of the watch. So, you know, for me personally, the 5980 over the 5990, but it's more size than anything else. The 5990 just sits larger on my hand. I'll, I'll be honest, I, I probably like the 5990 more just because for me, it, it's well integrated and it, it is not thick. It's only about half a millimeter more than the 5980. I thought it would be monstrous. When I first saw it, I thought it was gonna be like the size of an offshore. It's no, it's nothing like that. So I would say I like it because for me, a Nautilus is either complicated or simple. It's either the pure 5711, 3700, that sort of design, or it's gonna be a complication. And once you complicate, you may as well load it up if it's not gonna make the watch much larger. But if you're real sensitive to a millimeter here, a millimeter there, mm -hmm. I can see how it might get offensive because the 5711 is a thin watch. Neither the 5980 nor the 5990 is. And you know, one of the other quirks of the 5980, which is actually something I don't love about the watch, is that it doesn't have a moving second hand. And even though you can activate the chrono and it can run continuously, I'm just one of those people that just can't do that. I can't just have my chronograph always running. And I do like the motion of the 5990 so that you see that the watch is consistently running as opposed to when you look at the 5980 and it just, you know, it, it seems like it could be dead. Edward from Sweden is actually telling us 5712 with a steel bracelet all day. And he's correcting me, he's from Sweden, but currently he's in Budapest. He should look up our friend David Bredden of a blog to watch who lives in Budapest. That'd be, a, that'd be a fun party. That'd also be a great audience for us. All right, guys, keep them coming. We're gonna try to be more interactive than usual tonight, reminding our live chat. Uh, while we're doing this, I'm gonna talk about another watch here on the table, which, we really don't see that often, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to bring it on the show. And here we have a Rose Gold Nomos Lambda 39. So for those of you that know Nomos, you know Nomos as the you know, German-made, value-centric, 
dress watch with a, you know, with a quirky twist. Here we have the Lambda 39 in rose gold, which is one of the more expensive Nomos watches. And this particular watch is only available if the retailer purchases a collection of them, which is why more often than not, you don't really see them in stores. And you know, for us to have one pre-owned, I think is really cool because A, it shows that somebody's buying these pieces, and B, it you know gives our collectors and you know viewers out there the opportunity to see a watch from a brand uh, that they might not really associate with the brand. Yeah, it's important to note that this is the this is the Lambda 39. There is also a Lambda that is 42 millimeters, and that was the original Lambda from 2013. This one came out in 2015, and it's perhaps a little bit better as a dress watch because sub 40 is increasingly the thing today in dress watches. Now they had a double ethos with this watch: no bezel and no hands. It is incredibly minimalist, and in fact, what at first appears to be a regulator dial is in fact a power reserve. 84 hours. You can see it at 12 o'clock on the dial. And it's actually the dominant feature of the dial. You turn the watch over, and this is Nomos does Langa. This is the DUW 1001 manual wind, 84 hour power reserve, and hand finished. You will not find that, save a few parts like for instance, ratchet wheels on standard Nomos movements, they're mostly machine finished. This baby is hand finished, and note, an incredible sunburst coat, coat de soleil across the bridges. Jewels in the drivetrain set in chaton with heat blued screws like a longa movement. And again, like a longa movement, a freehand engraved balance staff. So, or I should say balance cock, the balance staff is the axle of the balance. So you have freehand engraving, hand finishing, jewels in chaton, the real thing, oxidized blue screws, and an all in house movement, both the bridges and the plates, as well as the assortment and the balance. It's the Nomos swing system. You know, when you see DUW Deutsche Ehrenwerk, that is the Nomos movement from the bridges to the plates to the hairspring to the escapement. And again, this watch deep into five figures represents the distinct minority of Nomos production. This is the Nomos you rarely see ordered. It's like the BMW V12 7 Series. By order only, you're not going to find it on a dealer lot. Yeah. And, you know, what I do appreciate that the brand has done is it has made it difficult to get this watch. You know, they, you know, we're a Nomos authorized dealer. I've seen one. You have to purchase, you know, an entire collection of them in order to even get the watch. Uh, and you have to order them for stock. So you have to be willing to take a bet uh, that you're going to sell the pieces. And, you know, it's very often the watch that, you know, a dealer probably would sell and probably would special order if they had a client come along and ask for the watch. But Nomos has done a very good job of not allowing that. And, you know, the only way that you can buy the watch is if the store has it. And as a result, they probably don't sell as many. But that being said, they've kept it tight. You don't see as many of them. And for that, I give them credit because if you saw one of these in every single shop and it sat there with the other Nomuses while the other Nomuses were selling, I think that it would uh, it would take away from, you know, from the watch. And they haven't done that, and I, I give them credit. I'll also say that the 42 with the Tiefblau dial is one of the most beautiful watches you'll find. White gold with a gorgeous blue-grained dial and the same minimalist hands and calibration. Don't look now, but for me, that's the closest thing next to the Longa Saxonia Thin Copper Blue to a genuine Chronomet Blue competitor. That that and the Longa Saxonia Thin Copper Blue would be my FP Journe CB rival. And right in the price point, too, is the uh, 42 in white gold with the blue dial is about $20,000. Yeah. So... Any questions from the chat that we have? Oh, we got lots of questions. Holker Batman from Jason Reeves. Uh, Hulk, I like green. Batman for me, I just think it's you know more wearable on a daily basis. Okay. Uh, here we have another special piece, which, again, pulling watches that I think, you know, are from brands everybody recognizes, but you don't see very often. And this year to, is special to me in that you've got a 15202OR. So for those of you that don't know reference numbers, it's a rose gold jumbo from Audemars Piguet. And this particular example of the watch was made in the first production series, uh, not the original jumbo, but in the latter part before the current version of the watch, where the AP logo is at the 12 o'clock. But what's great is that they actually made the watch both with a white dial and with a blue dial. Now, that's sort of gone away. You only see the rose gold jumbos with the blue dial. The occasional, I think, yellow gold with green was made as a limited edition. But it's a watch 
that you associate with having a blue dial. And I think that these earlier white dials from, what, was it 2000 to 2011, Tim? It was 2000 to 2011, yes, that this particular model of the 15202 was, was made. The reference number did not change for 2012, but much of the dial did, as well as the rotor. Right, and here you have a polar white dial. I think that it gives the watch a whole new look. And at 39 millimeter, I think that it's, you know, it's different than your traditional blue dial jumbo that you that you see continuously. I almost look at it more like a, a Rolex competitor is the wrong word, but I think it, it has like a, uh, an older world vintage feel to the watch because you don't see them anymore. So a couple of things that distinguish the pre-2012 from the post. Obviously, the AP signature moved back down to six. It did a little bit more of a 5402 type thing to look more like the original 1972 Genta model. But in terms of dial changes, a couple of things were altered. First, the AP moved down standard index at 12. Second, you can see that there are these miniature Arabic numerals outboard the indices. Those were eliminated, and the indices were extended outwards. The hands were lightly reprofiled, and though you can't quite see it with the silver dial, it's not a monotone coordinate coordinated date disc. So for all of the dials on the 15202s after 2012, the date disc would actually be the same color as the dial. Here's the dial is silver and the date disc is actually white. The Audemars Piguet logo was also reprofiled and made a bit more prominent for 2012. Another feature that I actually miss is the loss of the pre-2012 rotor. Now the rotor pre-2012 was absolutely gorgeous. Hand skeletonized, let me see if I can get light on this hand skeletonized and hand beveled internally with the AP logo right inside of it. It's a little bit more machine cut now. You can see the bevels are mechanically installed and the finish of the bevels themselves is entirely mechanical, whereas back then it was always done by hand. You can still have it engraved or customized by request, but back then it was always skeletonized by hand and then finished with beveling by hand, including sharp interior angles. So it was just a more beautiful movement back then. And of course, in time, the clasp has changed. This one's a little bit more difficult for me to operate with my precisely groomed nails for the watch videos. But a gorgeous watch, and I, I do bemoan the loss of the old rotor. Uh, I'm neutral on the dial. I think it's more noticeable on the darker dials. That's when you really want the monotone date disc. Here, it's kind of a wash. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that it's a, you know, as I said, it's a watch that you don't, you know, you don't often see and you don't often uh, as quickly associate with the brand as this model having a white dial. And I think that it's, uh, it's unique and uh, interestingly enough, back when they were producing these watches, the watch world was very different and you could actually switch between the dials if you wanted to. So we've seen some of these come in where the customer has both the blue and the, the white dial, silver dial with the watch that you could change between the two because they were willing to give the parts out at that time. So it's no longer yeah. the case. They definitively <laughs> yeah. no longer Ask do for that. that now. Yeah, good luck. But uh, but back then, you know what? It was a it was a different ball game and you know we've seen them uh, come with both, which is a you know very cool feature. So question from Ray Bonifon. Brian and Tim, any retired movements from the larger houses that should be brought back from retirement? Yes, as a matter of fact. If you wanted to do a legitimately cool Speedmaster limited edition caliber 321, what you saw with the recent first wrist chronograph, the 18 CHRO, uh, you know, that, that watch was my idea for the 60th anniversary Speedmaster. I would have loved to have seen the watch that we now call the Trilogy Speedmaster powered by a hand-finished, restored, new old stock caliber 321. So the Omega 321, based on the old Le Mans Abouche, uh, the Le Mans 2310. I would also like to see a return of the old Zenith 2562 as a base caliber. I, I, would, I never want to see the return of a Salita SW300, so the old school like 1960s and 70s Zenith Automatic in the pre-elite years. And finally, I would like to see the return of, well, I, I guess I can ask for an old movement to be brought out of retirement, even if it exists elsewhere. I'd love to see a Nautilus powered by the old JLC 920, like the old 3700. That'd be cool. Okay. Do you, I, do you have any? I mean, I feel like you went over them all. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the only movement that, I shouldn't even say the only movement, but a movement that I've talked about a lot that I would like to be brought back in a watch. I don't even know if it's officially retired, but it's the 
Zenith tenth of a second movement. Oh, the striking tenth. The striking yeah. tenth that they came out with the limited edition of the watch that really, I think, put Zenith back on the map when they launched that watch. And it came back as a limited edition, and then they stopped it. And that, it, and then, it came back in all different variations, but not with that, with not with that movement. The problem is now they've got the caliber nine thousand four and the Dayfi twenty one, which is one one hundredth of a second. Which it's it's literally the exact same thing, but. 10 times as fast. Yeah. So w w would you like it as a junior flying second? Or, or would you prefer that they just I think I would just like them to, to bring back that watch as a stock watch. I know, I mean, I know that's tough and it would stink for the people that bought the limited edition, but I would yeah. I would like them to make like a, like a minute change and just bring the watch back. I would love to see them bring it back with a giant mainspring barrel and no chronograph functions. Just just make that the seconds hand. Wah, wah, wah. Make it like a, 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 a a one-tenth of a second version of the Espada, the time-only El Primero, that would be cool. Uh, I, would right. also, I would also say I would like to see a return of the FP Journe 1499, the original uh, Tourbillon Remontoir movement. That would be cool for a special series. Okay, so I'm going to talk about another watch that we have on the, uh, on the table. Um, that is definitely a watch that doesn't get enough love, and that is the Patek Philippe Perpetual Calendar 3940. So this is a watch that was produced for, was it 18 years, 19 years? It was produced from roughly 1986 85. to about 2004, 2005. Right, and then replaced with the 5140, which has incidentally also been replaced. But this was the workhorse perpetual for decades. Uh, and it's a watch that I think has gone un, you know, underappreciated in the Patek Philippe collector's market because you know, it's not quite new, but it's also not quite vintage. And it's the closest that you're going to get in a modern era watch to a vintage piece, uh, especially in styling. And, you know, they're becoming rare and rare. The, you know, I would say firstly, the non-yellow gold pieces, you know, particularly the platinum, the white and the rose. This is a rose example. It's a third series, uh, you know, third series, meaning that the watch was made in different iterations over the course uh, of that 18 to 19 year span. Um, but what I love about the watch uh, is that they've all aged a little bit differently, as you can see by the patinaing on the sub dial there on the front. Um, and, you know, I'm a big fan of the watch. I'm a big fan of the size, the overall layout. I think that this was one of the most perfectly executed watches that Patek Philippe has ever done. It's a watch that for a very long time was available uh, at extremely reasonable prices, um, you know, given what the retail price of the 5140 was, uh, you know, you could pick these up, you know, at a certain point in the mid to high 20s to the low to mid 30s, depending upon which one you bought. Ooh, and, shot. and they have slowly uh, gone up to the point though where in the last few years, they've actually gone up a lot. And I think that's because a, they're drying up. B, there was never that many of them produced, especially in these other metals. You saw a lot more of them produced in yellow. Uh, and it's, you know, I think that people are making a bet on just that these are going to be some of the next watches that, you know, that go up in value. And they just happen to be gorgeous. They also don't respond well to polishing in a lot of these cases like a lot of 5070s, have been absolutely savage to the point that, for example, the bezel loses a lot of its definition and the lugs become uneven. So while well, probably about 7,000 of these were made all told, once you break them down by metal and series and pre and post a priori marks and pre and post 1995 hallmarks, you can really segment the production. And this was either one of the last old school Patek complications or one of the first new ones, depending on how you judge it generationally. You could see that this one with the post-1995 hallmarks, but it also has the Sigma or a priori dial, probably made between 1995 and 1999. This one's also a nice body double for an advanced research annual calendar if you don't look too closely and see the sector of the quadrants of the leap year. It's got a DeLorean style vertically satin grained metallic finished dial that seems to be getting lost in the camera, but it's absolutely beautiful in person. And of course, all of these made pre-19 or 2009, they all feature the Geneva hallmark, so old school. Yeah, th for me, this is the one on the table that I would have to have. I just, I, I absolutely love the watch. I love the size, I love the layout. I love the, you know, the old world feel to it, but in a more modern, in a more modern size and layout. And I just think that it is, 
freaking phenomenal. I'd probably go with the mid-sized Nautilus or the 1940, the 1942. Oh, we haven't even talked we, about that. We haven't yet. talked about the 1942. So here, this is actually a watch that I've brought on the show before. When the, you know, when it first came out, we had one of the first ones. Uh, this is the Vacheron Historique 1942 in stainless steel. So for those of you that don't know, uh, Vacheron every year comes out with a historic piece that is an homage to a watch from their past in a more, uh, with a more modern feel to it, more possibly a more modern case size. Uh, but truly, uh, you know, an homage. And, you know, with the popularity of, you know, vintage watches now, especially vintage throwback watches, uh, you know, it seemed uh, like a great idea. And it was. The watches have done great. And, uh, you know, Tim here is going to show you. You've got here the the red track date going around the, the circumference of the dial. Uh, you've got that sort of silver grain finish uh, and the corn de vache logs. And, I, you know, Overall, great watch. They came out with it at a compelling price point. And it's a watch that, you know, even now, surprisingly, as popular as it was when it first launched, you know, I think is, you know, they're still hard to get. But I would think that, uh, you know, it, um, you know, it goes underappreciated still. It definitely does. It's a lovely piece. And I had an extended talk on this one. I soloed a bit on watches live last night, but the important things right here, this is inspired by the 1942 reference 4240 triple date, originally powered by Jagere LeCoult manual wind caliber. Uh, this one right here being perhaps the more desirable of two models that came out in late 2017. One Correct. was gold. That was the 1948. This is the 1942. This one significantly features the fetching claw style lugs, which some will compare to the Corn de Vache cowhorn. It's got a stunning almost... Is it not Corn de Vache? Uh, strictly speaking, this is not quite the corn de vache. It's, it's like that. Generally, these are described as claw lugs. But the other thing that's important to remember is that the profile of this case could have come from Fritz Lang's Metropolis. It is so late Art Deco. I'm absolutely in love with this thing. And the fact that it is a full Geneva hallmark movement and case gives it a level of credibility as a steel entry-level Vacheron that, for example, I don't believe the 2018-56 self-winding without that distinction quite reflects. Th this is what an entry-level Vacheron should be. Did you bring this on the show last night? I did. I should have watched. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to start, I'm gonna have to start watching that, you know, but for those of you that don't, uh, you know, that don't watch Tim on uh, Tuesdays, they get to catch it on Wednesdays. Okay, so we had a gentleman named Clive Wrangler, who's uh, Clive Watch Wrangler, who's asking, whether I think the Patek Fleep 5110 is the least desirable to world time references. No, honestly, I would say probably, probably the 5130 by virtue of the number made and the fact that its size and profiling is a little bit out of step with current tastes. The 5110, which was made from 2000 to about early 2006, has a very strong following and a strong market. It's a smaller watch. Obviously, its its crown profile is different. Its hand profile is different. And I think that with the 39.5 millimeter case and the crown guards of the 5130, as well as the many, many iterations, the only really dear and desirable 5130 is the 5131 enamel dial. Uh, the rest of the 5130s, people seem to take them for granted. It may yet be that the 5230 becomes the least desirable. Ultimately, you know, experience and I think familiarity breed contempt. If the 5230 is the most mass producible, that will become the least desired. And I think that will be your gauge. I, I believe at this moment, the 5130 is the least loved. Yeah, I mean, my, I'm, particularly my favorite of them all is actually the 5110. I think the 37 millimeter was the perfect size for the watch. Uh, and I think that the, you know, the call for the increase in size to, move towards maybe a more modern taste or more modern case size, uh, you know, overall wasn't really that necessary on the watch. I think that the 5110 was actually my favorite execution of it. It was actually, and you, we see that in that the colored metal variations of them, the, the rose, the platinum, and the white, actually, as soon as they come in, they go out. You know, again, like the 3940, I believe quite a few more of the J were made than any of the other metals. I would say in general yellow gold too. Don't don't undersell the problem of selling yellow gold. It's not cool right now, regardless of reference. White metals are hot, enamel dials are hot with respect to Patek world times. I, I do believe ultimately the 5110 will be the most loved of the modern world time watches. Yeah. 
I'll also say this. A question someone asked about whether the Vacheron World Time is worth 25000 more than the Mont Blanc Orbis Terrarum. In a photo, you would say no. When you hold them in your hand and you actually see how they function and you see how Vacheron integrates 37 time zones, you, you would say yes. I think it's a watch that has to be seen in person to be fully appreciated. And that's why we offer a seven-day no-questions-asked return policy, because when you're buying something you haven't seen in person or worn on the wrist, you deserve the right to say yes or no. I don't think it's worthwhile. And buyer's remorse is an acceptable reason to return a watch. So with something like that, you know, the watch box really helps you out with our return policy. And ultimately, if you're deciding between a Mont Blanc and a Vacheron with a $25,000 price delta, I say just buy them both and return the one you don't like. <laughs> I agree. Why wonder? Um, but, uh, but no, so I think that's all that we have for tonight. Um, I think, you know, I'm getting the cue that we've hit the, uh, you know, the time. So, uh, you know, guys, thank you for having me back. Uh, it's been a two week hiatus, just, you know, getting all the yips out of myself, you know, got to get back to used to being in front of the camera. But, uh, again, as always, if there's anything that you guys would like us to review on the show, any watches that you see on the site that you want to be brought on, that you want to know more information about, or just overall any questions that you have that you want us to, you know, bring about and talk about as a topic on the show, please don't hesitate to ask because, you know, we produce this show for you, uh, and it's, you know, why we're here every week. My name is Brian. I'm Tim. Who you guys all know, and thank you guys for logging on.